Can you see chapter 29? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, so the class today don't expect to become a expert rhythm interpreter. Okay, this is just basic rhythm interpretation, just necessary for us to answer the NFLEX. There's already a recorded session on iTunes U uh, if you need a refresher, but I'm, I'm also recording the, the class. So um, since we are, I'll, I'll give you a shorter version, okay? Just a uh, ask me, I mean, the need to know version. So how our dysrhythmias develop are, these are the risk factors that puts us at higher risk for dysrhythmias. An MI, um, because some cells died, some tissues, parts of the heart died, so that will affect um, electrical conduction. Um, one thing important to note is that the heart is independent, meaning unlike skeletal muscles that need nerve impulses in order to function, for instance, our skeletal muscles. So if you have a spinal cord injury, you cannot move uh, or feel anything un uh, below the, uh, the level of the injury. Um, so therefore, although there were nothing wrong with your muscles before the spinal cord injury, they're now useless because there is now no more nerve impulses traveling to that area. The heart doesn't work like that. The heart can generate its own impulses. Therefore, it does not need nerve innervation. Is that it doesn't require um, stimulation before it can it can um, it can function. So it has its own action potential. It generates its own electrical impulses. It stimulates itself, all right? So in, although it can be influenced by several factors, for instance, the sympathetic nervous system can raise and lower, uh, uh, raise your heart rate, raise blood pressure, uh, whereas the parasympathetic um, simulation will cause a lower heart rate. Anyway, these are the causes, frequent causes of a dysrhythmia, meaning if you're asked a test question, which of the following patients are at risk for dysrhythmias, these will be your answers. So select all that apply. These are the answers. In the case of infections, we're referring to sepsis here. So this would fall under severe sepsis or even septic shock. The patient will have uh, dysrhythmias as a result. Um, it's a kind of long story, but how sepsis does it is because the patient's blood pressure drops, so therefore cardiac output or perfusion drops, and then remember the, the heart needs perfusion too. So if the, patient, if the patient's heart suffers ischemia because of low cardiac output, then that's the time that we develop uh, dysrhythmias as a result. Regardless of the type of dysrhythmia, each patient will tolerate dysrhythmia uniquely. So for instance, if you put two patients side by side and one, uh, both of them have a heart rate of let's say 35, one would be unconscious, the other could still be wide awake or can even ambulate. You can also see patients with a heart rate of 150 already unconscious somebody 150 just walking around All right so this is what i mean by since what i'm trying to say is since dysrhythmias affect people differently therefore your first action whenever you see a dysrhythmia on a cardiac monitor is to look at the patient first so you always go assess your patient how is your patient tolerating the dysrhythmia because uh, as we learn later not all dysrhythmias will be treated. Some of them, you just try to eliminate the cause, and that is your only action. Some of them, by treatment, I'm referring to anti-dysrhythmic medications. So not all patients will 
require medications to treat the dysrhythmia. Sometimes you can just eliminate the cause and that, that's the only intervention. Regardless of this, the dysrhythmia, there is no dysrhythmia that doesn't affect cardiac output. All of them reduce cardiac output. So regardless if it's AFib, BTAC, sinus Brady, heart blocks, they all affect cardiac output. So these bullets here are all signs and symptoms of somebody with a low cardiac output. So if blood pressure drops, perfusion is decreased, these are your signs and symptoms. So they have common signs and symptoms. You may get questions on the tests for signs and symptoms, but probably not a lot because most of the signs and symptoms are similar. The most of the questions will of course be on the the um, the causes. So you'll be asked what's causing this dysrhythmia, and then of course you'll be asked what do you do about it. All right, any questions so far? Okay, so don't forget these, okay? Because these are the common signs and symptoms. It doesn't matter if the heart rate's so fast, heart rate so slow, all of them result in decreased cardiac output. So therefore, it will automatically stimulate this uh, the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system, of course, will be responsible for why the patient has palpitations, why the patient feels cold and clammy because they're sweating, uh, really cold sweat, okay? Because that's from vasoconstriction. Uh, so those are, again, uh, responses to the low cardiac output. So let's review our normal conduction pathway. So in a normal heart, we have the SA node as our primary pacemaker. Let me write on this. Okay, so imagine this is your heart right here. And this is your septum. And that's the, this is the right atrium. I mean, yeah, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. So our SA node is right here at the entrance of the right, atri right atrium. Then we have the AB node right here, which is your secondary pacemaker. And then our tertiary pacemaker are the left and right. Well, this will be our left, our right, but this will be the patient's left, the patient's right bundle branches. And then we have the Purkinje fibers. All of them are pacemakers. However, the primary one which is able to generate 60 to 100 beats a minute is the SA node. So this is our primary one. So this will be represented by the P wave. I'll explain the waves and complexes later. So all heartbeats must be initiated by the SA node. And if that is so, it will look like a P wave on the EKG strip. So when the P wave Fire, when the SA node fires, it will generate a P wave, which makes the both the atria, the right and the left atrium, contract together because there are sinoatrial branches here, interatrial branches. As the SA node fires, it will be sent to the right and the left atrium. And then both right and left atrium will contract at the same time. You've seen lightning, right? When the lightning lights up the sky and then you see, you see it, let's say you're at the beach and on a stormy day, you, all of us have seen that. So if you see lightning light up the sky and then hit something in the water, did it take a long time? Did you wait? like um, several moments 
to for that to occur? No, happens in the blink of an eye. Yeah, instantaneously, right? So it'll be the same. As soon as the electrical impulse is generated by the SA node, they will be transmitted to both atria instantaneously and then causing both atria to contract. Now, that same electrical impulse has to travel down to the AV node. Now, the AV node is also a pacemaker. It's only a secondary pacemaker, though. It's only use. Uh, no, there are two uses here. One is if the SA node doesn't fire right here, for some reason, the SA node fails to fire, the AV node can generate impulses, however, Unlike the SA node, wherein it can only it can it can generate SA node can generate 60 to 100, the AV node is only capable of generating 40 to 60 beats a minute. So this will be a reason why when we talk about heart blocks later, heart blocks is a condition wherein the signal or the impulse coming from the SA node somehow is reaching the AV node late or it's not reaching the AV at all. all. Right? So again, let me review. So the impulse will be generated by the SA node, goes to both atria, causing the atria to contract, and then that same impulse reaches the AV node, and then the AV node will transmit the same signal. This this is different. This is this is normal pathway. So the SA node fires so the AV node receives that impulse and then the AV node delays it. It does not transmit it right away. It delays it between 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds before it transmits it down to the left and right bundle branches and then to the Purkinje fibers and then the ventricles contract, meaning there is a necessary or a natural delay between atrial contraction and ventricular contraction. That is the normal conduction pathway. So this occurs 60 to 100 times every minute, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So this is what's happening to us every single minute. So um, the SA node fires, the signal goes to the left and right atria, and then the atria contract, however, that signal when it reaches the AV node, it doesn't get transmitted right away. So that is the second purpose of the AV node. It delays the signal, that way there's time for blood to leave the atria, enter the ventricles from both atria before it contracts. Okay, so therefore that delay is very, very important. And that's the job of the AV node. It has to delay the impulse. That way there is normal cardiac output. Because imagine, just like the example I gave with the lightning, it didn't take long at all. So as soon as that electrical impulse was generated by the SA node, it will reach the AV node and then down the left and right a uh, bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers. So it will cause all four chambers to contract at the same time, at exactly the same time. Now that would be disastrous because if all of them are contracting at the same time, how is blood moving anywhere? Okay, so if they contract all at the same time, blood tries to go in here, but then this one is also pushing blood out. So there has to be a delay. So that uh, 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 second delay is the job of the AV node. Any questions so far with, with this concept? Okay, very good. So please read the whole thing, okay? So uh, that's how the, the long story short. So that's how electrical conduction moves. So the pathway, this is the, sh the position of the heart. So this is your, let's say this is your thorax. So it's uh, right in the center of your chest. That's the mediastinum. 
but the heart is tilted toward the left. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's angled toward the left, so the electrical conduction technically is going sideways. So it's going from your right shoulder down to your left leg. Okay, that is the direction of the electrical impulse. All right, so if as long as that is occurring, then we have good cardiac output. Um, the Purkinje fibers is the last pacemaker, meaning if all else fails, let's say the SA node fails and then the AV node takes over, right? But then the resulting heart rate would be considerably lower because it only generates 40 to 60 beats a minute. If the AB node fails, then the Purkinje fibers will take over. However, since it's only able to generate impulses between 20 and 40, forget about it. It's going to be useless. Um, it's not even worth talking about because it's there's no way it's, it can it can um, make up for the um, loss of the SA or AB node. Okay, pulseless electrical activity. Uh, of course, this is um, this is not technically uh, asystole because there is electrical conduction here. However, it's not able to produce a pulse. Therefore, do you have an effective cardiac output here? Meaning that the heart here is beating. However, is it generating enough? blood pressure to reach a peripheral part of your body. No, that's why it's called a pulseless electrical activity. Uh, we'll discuss these later. Um, as this as already described here, because there is no pulse, so you have basically no cardiac output. But since the heart is technically still beating, uh, we have to help it out. So the treatment for this is chest compression, CPR, epinephrine, um, the whole ACLS. So because it's just like the patient is uh, there, but then it's not, you know, the heart isn't doing anything, nothing effective uh, at least, meaning it's beating, but there's no pulse. So this happens in uh, particularly um, VTAC. Um, although VTAC can have a pulse, uh, but you also have a pulseless VTAC, meaning the heart, that's an example of pulseless electrical activity, meaning the heart is beating so fast, it will go even faster because once cardiac output drops, remember sympathetic nervous system is automatically stimulated. So that will cause epinephrine to be released and then it will cause further um, further increase in heart rate. However, the, the heart is so weak that it cannot, just cannot uh, generate enough blood pressure, enough cardiac output. Before we look at dysrhythmias, let's look at what a normal rhythm looks like first. So uh, we will do the basic waves and complexes. We have the P, Q, R, S, and the T wave. So these are our basic waves and complexes. P wave are these spikes right here. And the QRS is a complex starting with a Q, R, and S. Those are your QRS. Uh, P wave stands for or represents atrial contraction. So the atria are contracting. Um, okay, for you to, before I go any further, so the EKG paper is a series of horizontal and vertical lines. The horizontal axis represents time in seconds. The vertical axis represents voltage in um, uh, joules. Okay, 
um, again, the vertical axis is the voltage and the horizontal axis, the horizontal line is representing time in seconds. Uh, the P wave is again representing atrial contraction. So the atria are contracting. So if you see P waves, that's very nice. Meaning we know that uh, this is half the battle. Uh, we know that um, the atria are contracting and that the signal or the impulse is coming from the SA node. Okay, so it's good to see P waves. We start to worry when we don't see P waves. QRS is representing ventricular contraction. So this is now the impulse generated by the SA node and then it reached the AV node and then the AV node transmitted it to the ventricles causing the vent them to contract and this is represented by the QRS complex. So you can see clearly this is all time, right? The horizontal axis is time in seconds. So if the P wave is atrial contraction, so you can clearly see there's a time delay here between, because this is where the impulse started from the SA node, causing the atria to contract. And then that same impulse did not reach the AV node until about here. So this is the time from between the SA node generated the impulse up to here, wherein it, the AV node transmitted it to the ventricles. And then once it transmitted it, causes the ventricles to contract. And then there's um, a delay again, because this is your T wave. So the start of the T wave is around here. T wave is, there's no contraction here. The T wave is representing ventricular repolarization. Contraction is also called depolarization, or that means the because the um, the cells are uh, positive uh, can be negatively or positively charged. So the more positive the cell is, the more likely it will discharge or depolarize. Or in the case of the heart, it uh, contracts. All right. So the T wave is because the heart just depolarized here, meaning it discharged all the positive ions out of its, out from inside the cell, resulting in the contraction. And then here it's starting to become more positively charged again until it's time for the next heartbeat. And then the cycle repeats 60 to 100 times a minute. Again, I will, uh, let, let's discuss again. So P wave is representing atrial contraction. QRS complex is the ventricular contraction. And then the T wave is ventricular repolarization, meaning the ventricles are getting positively charged again, meaning the calcium uh, ions are entering the cell again, causing the cell to become more positively charged. And then by the time it's full of positive uh, ions, then it will discharge again on the next heartbeat. Same thing for the atria. But the atria, we don't see where it repolarizes. So we're guessing because since the QRS or the ventricles repolarize right here after, right after depolarization, so we're guessing the atria must repolarize somewhere here it's probably hidden by the ventricular contraction because you can see the, uh, remember the vertical axis represents voltage, right? So you can see how much electrical activity there are in the atria versus the ventricles. Look at the T wave. There's no contraction here, but look at the amount of electrical activity in the ventricles, even when they're at rest compared to the atria when they are actually contracting is almost uh, higher in the even higher in the in the in the ventricles compared to the atria when they are contracting again the important thing to note is the horizontal axis is time in seconds and the vertical 
axis is voltage. Um, and this is the time again. So this is the whole P wave from when it left the... Um, uh, one more thing about the EKG is there is an imaginary uh, isoelectric line here, meaning there's a straight line. As If you notice, no wave or complex actually falls and rises on a exactly straight line. I mean, on, on a solid line on the graph. Take this one, for instance. This line here is not on any solid line. So there is a uh, imaginary isoelectric line here from which all the waves rises and falls. So for instance, if this is our isoelectric line, you see the P wave rise from this isoelectric line. It, it, it left that line and then returned to that same imaginary line before the next wave and complexes resume. Right, so we have an isoelectric line there. Um, besides the P wave, QRS, and the T wave, we also have two periods here. So the period or the delay from when the SA node fired the signal to when the AV node received it but delayed transmission is called this time here from the P wave to before the Q wave, this is called the PR interval. PR interval. I know it's confusing because the R wave is right here. Don't ask me why they call it the PR interval, uh, but that's how we call it. Um, I don't really know the reason. Uh, so the PR interval is here from here, this dot, this line right here to right here. Okay, so that is the PR interval. Again, don't get confused because this is the Q and that's the R. But the PR interval is measured from the P to right before the Q begins. And there's another period here called the ST segment. ST segment is usually isoelectric, meaning nothing's happening there. So for this example, the ST segment is measured from the S and then and right before the T begins. So it's rising here. So this whole section here, this is the ST segment. And this is the T wave from when it leaves the isoelectric line, goes up, and then goes back down to the isoelectric line. Any questions so far? So let's um, look at the heart rate. You know what, let's go to the next page. All right, uh, let's explain the ECG paper. ECG was invented by Dr. Eindhoven. I don't know when. The most popular ECG is the 12 lead EKG. This is the minimum. Now we have 24, we have 36 lead EKGs. But our basic minimum to make a cardiac rhythm diagnosis, uh, at least for the doctor, because they're the one making a diagnosis, we need a 12 lead EKG. A 12 what lead what EKG. Um, those are enough for telemetry monitoring. Um, however, they will only give you about five views, meaning it's, it's limited. It's enough to tell you basically what's going on with the patient. However, in order to make a diagnosis, we need a 12 lead EKG. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. You, you, can, you can detect changes in the patient's rhythm with a three lead. That's the fastest way we can we can do it uh, because it's not practical for a patient to be hooked up to a 12 lead EKG walking around. Okay, that's just not right. It doesn't, you know, it's very inconvenient. So we're uh, 
for telemetry, three lead is fine. However, for uh, EKG, in order to make a medical diagnosis of a heart uh, cardiac rhythm disturbance, is a 12 lead EKG. Now, don't be surprised when you use a EKG machine that it only has 10 electrodes. Those 10 electrodes, though, will give you 12 views. So lead here has two meanings. Lead can either refer to the electrode. The electrode is the actual um, wire that you put on the patient's skin. So there will be uh, six chest leads, meaning six chest electrodes. Um, and there will be four limb electrodes or limb leads for a total of 10 electrodes or 10 leads. Again, the, the lead that we're talking about here are the electrodes. Okay, these are the wires that we place strategically on the patient's body. However, the interaction of these different leads will give you 12 different views. When we say 12 views now, this is like literally, if you put the heart on a pedestal, on a table, for instance, you will have 12 different photographers taking a picture or a view of the heart from different angles. For instance, uh, I, I can't explain the whole thing because it's, it's a long period. Uh, ECG interpretation is a, for a monitor tech, it's a three day class. We only have less than three hours. We, we technically have two hours to explain this. Anyway, the leads either have one, um, one positive and one negative electrode, or they can be just one positive or one negative. So those are what we call unipolar or bipolar leads. Anyway, so a long story short, so let's say um, the right shoulder lead or the right arm lead and we have a left arm lead, right? The, the line of sight, meaning I'm talking about the, the view of the uh, photographer, although um, the right arm is called ABR, okay? So AB right arm and then ABF, uh, ABL will be uh, AB left arm. If you look at AVR though, the line of sight for AVR is actually taken from the left. So if you look at AVR on the ECG paper, which I don't have one here. Um, okay, let's look at a Can you see this paper? Yeah, yes yeah. or no? Okay. So this is a 12 lead. You can see it, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, not listed here is there is a lead on the left side here. 
on where my mouse is. So there's lead one, lead two, lead three. Lead one is Okay, can you see my screen on the EKG paper? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. So this is lead one, lead two, lead three. Um, this is based on the Eindhoven triangle. So this is the patient's heart right here. This is lead one. This is lead, no, this is lead one, sorry. One, two, and three. So remember I said that the conduction pathway is from the right shoulder down to the left leg. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to let Richard in. All right, so let's say this is the conduction pathway, right? So this is lead one, lead two, lead three. The, the, the photographer or lead one is looking at the heart from the top, okay? Looking at it down like this. And then lead two, of course, is looking at it from this angle. Lead three is looking at it from this angle. Now for ABR, since this is the right arm right here, that's where ABR is. It's looking at the heart. This is where it gets a little bit weird because the vector is uh, ABR is connected from right to left. However, the line of sight is actually from here. So if you look at ABR, it's actually looking at the heart from this angle here and then vice versa. Um, and then you have the AV, um, AVF is a B foot that's referring to the left foot, the left leg. So the left leg is a B F. So it's looking at the heart from this angle. Then you have six chest, chest leads, B one, two, three, four, five, six, which are placed one here on the, um, this is the sternum right here. So this is V1, V2, and then you have V4, 5, 3, sorry, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3, 4, 5, 6 are on, the 6 will be close to the mid-axillary uh, area. So all of them, all of these interactions here will give you a uh, 12 different views of the heart looking at them from different sides. Now, how does this translate to a diagnosis? So the doctor will see where are the changes in the PQRS complexes? Are they seen here, here, or here? Because remember, they correspond to the angle. So let's say when you're looking at a, um, a right ventricle MI, for instance, let's say here, uh, affecting the right coronary, or, uh, right coronary artery, of course, he will look at lead two. And then he, if he's, you know, wherever, so therefore wherever the disturbances are, where the abnormalities are, gives you an idea about the location of the, of the infarct or the ischemia that's causing these uh, ECG changes. So the doctor will use the 12 lead EKG to find it, to make a tentative diagnosis so that they can generate a plan of care of, of what to do how they do the surgical intervention, for instance, uh, which artery is involved. Of course, this will only aid the diagnosis. Uh, they still need to do other tests, let's say echoes, for instance, 
or take the patient to the cath lab to visually see where the obstructions are. Uh, does that help a little bit maybe, no? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go back to the uh, EKG paper. All right, so that was the ECG. Now, we already know that the horizontal axis is time in seconds, and then the vertical axis is voltage. Uh, let's look at the actual measurements now. So the height, which is not really significant for our purpose, um, the height for each small box is one millimeter. And um, it's also measured in uh, 0.04 seconds, meaning the vertical axis of the uh, each small box is one millimeter in height. And then we also have in seconds, it's 0.04 seconds. So here is an illustration. So this is your EKG, ECG paper. So we have big blocks and small blocks. So this is one big block right here. So if we look at this one here, this section here has one, two, three, four, five, six big blocks. So therefore you can see this is one big block and inside one big block are 25 small blocks. So here is one big block, we magnified it. So if each tiny block, so we'll refer to this as a small block. So one small block is 0 0.04 seconds. So therefore times five equals 0 0.2 seconds. So therefore one big block is 0 0.2 seconds and measures five millimeters in height. Does that make sense? Again, so this is one big block on an ECG paper. The horizontal axis is time in seconds. So there are um, five small blocks horizontally in one big block. If each tiny small block is measuring 0 0.04 seconds, therefore five of them, one, two, three, four, five, which is in one big block is 0 0.2 seconds. Now, if I ask you, therefore, how many um, small blocks are there in one minute. So if you divide 60 by 0 0.04 seconds, how many small blocks are there? One thousand five hundred. Very good. There are 1,500 small blocks in one minute. How about big blocks? If one big block measures 0 0.2 seconds, how many big blocks are there in one minute? 300. Very good. So we have 300 big blocks in one minute, 1,500 small blocks in one minute. We need also a minimum of six seconds in order to interpret a rhythm. Why six seconds? Because it's easy. One minute has to 60 seconds. So if you put a six second strip, you measure whatever measurements you have there, you multiply it by 10 equals one minute. So we need a minimum of six second strip. It's not practical to analyze a 60, sec a 60 second strip. That is extremely long. We will need several tables which we don't have at the nurse's station. You have one tiny workspace in front of a computer or your cow, or your cow for instance, your, your computer on wheels. There's no space to analyze a one minute strip. 
you don't have the time, you don't have the space. So we, we need only a minimum of six seconds. So you print a six second strip on the, from, the, from the monitor station, and then you cut it and that's what you analyze. So there are three second markers though, it's easy. Not in this illustration, but let's see. Um, there's none here, okay. Um, that's okay, we'll make our own six second strip. So we know that 0 0.2 seconds is one big block. So therefore, how many big blocks in one second? Hello, how many big blocks in one second? 300? No, one, one second. Oh, one second. Yeah, how many big blocks? Five. Five, okay. So therefore, for every five big blocks is one second. So let's start from here. So one, two, three, four, five. We know this is one second right here. So we will put a three, uh, one second marker right here, right after this number three. So there's a one second marker. And then that means there's another second here, marker here. So marker here, marker, uh, this is one second. So another five, one, two, three, four, five. This is two seconds right here. One, two, three, four, five. So therefore I can put a three second marker here another three second marker here. And then let's see if we have another three seconds on the right side. So one, two, three, four, five, one second. One, two, three, four, five, two seconds. One, two, three, four, five. So exactly six seconds. So this whole strip is six seconds. So we have one three second marker here, another here, and then another here. All right, so we have our six second strip. First step in interpreting an EKG is looking, uh, is to count the heart rate. Now we know that a PQRST is one heartbeat. So the easiest way to count, there are three methods that we will use for uh, the test. So the first uh, method is uh, this thing here looks regular to me, meaning the, the waves and complexes appear to be occurring at the same time. If you are not sure, um, you need a caliper. Since none of us have a caliper, you can use a ruler. Or if you don't have a ruler, get a piece of paper. So everybody grab a piece of paper, any white paper. It has to be clean. And then put your paper against your screen, against your computer screen, and then measure the distance between, mark the distance, okay? Mark the distance on your paper from this R wave here to this R wave. Then after you've made that mark, move that marker from this R to this R, this R to this R, this R to this R, so on. Are they occurring at regular intervals? approximately yes yes equal. right they seem to be occurring at the same time correct so when you see that then that means the the rhythm i'm not saying the cardiac rhythm meaning the rhythm the the regularity or irregularity of this is it's regular this has a regular rhythm meaning the r seem to be occurring at the same time if you want to use the P instead instead of the R, you can do the same. I'm sure it'll be the same. So use the same markers from one P to the next P. So this is, these are your P waves, and you'll see that it's about the same. Are they the same? Yes. All right, so you've just created a poor man's caliper. Calipers cost between $6, $10, depending on what you have, uh, what you want to buy. Those things walk, and you know what I mean by when they walk. You put them down at the station, they disappear. I don't know who steals them, but somebody always does. 
I've had calipers, I don't know how many times. I lose them every time. If you put it down, somebody takes it. There's some um, gnome or an elf there somewhere that steals these calipers. I don't know who. One day, maybe I'll get them. Anyway, nothing beats uh, paper. Okay, so you have a poor man's caliper. That's enough. Although we need to measure, but you, there's other ways to measure it because we already have the time in seconds anyway. So let's count this heart rate. So in order to, for a heart rate to count, a heartbeat to count, it must be PQRST. So which do you want to start? Can we start with this PQRST here? Can we count this as a heart rate, as a heartbeat? Because we have six seconds here. We have to count how many heartbeats are in this six second strip and then multiply it by 10. Can we count this one? No. Uh, looking at it, you say no. However, remember that the last heartbeat here, there's plenty of space because the T wave technically ends here. So we have a whole 0 0.2 seconds worth of space here not used. So if you move this just a little bit to the right, can we count this now? And it's, is, is it still within the six seconds? In your estimation, can we do that? Because really this last heartbeat here stops right here. So we have 0 0.2 seconds worth that we could move the entire thing to the right. And if we do that, can we fit this P wave in there now? Yes. Yes. So yes. Now, now we can include this one. So let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times 10. What is the heart rate? 80. 80. All right. So that's the first method. The second method is let's do the big blocks and the small boxes. So how many big boxes again in one minute? Was it What's 300? It? Okay, 300. There are 300 big boxes in one minute. So let's count the number of big boxes between one heartbeat and the next heartbeat. So let's pick a R wave that falls right on a solid line. Which one will it be? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which R wave falls right on a solid line? R wave number? Five. Number five. So let's look at our wave number five right here, since it falls on a solid line. That way we can count the number of big blocks, big boxes between this R wave and this R wave. So let's count one, two, three. And this is half right here. So this would be three point what? So if this is 3.5 right here. So this would be 3.8. Yeah. So let's say 3.8 big blocks between big boxes between this R wave and this R wave. So 300 big boxes divided by 3.8. What do you get? Seventy. 8.9. Very good. So is it within the margin of error? Because we counted the heart rate, estimated heart rate earlier. We got it at 80. So is there a big, big uh, difference? Uh, is there more than 10 heart rate difference between 78 and 80? No. No. Will your therapy be uh, different between seven, somebody who has a heart rate of 78 versus 80? Will no. your... No. Oh, They're both... Professor round it. Like since it's uh, again, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, it's not significant because all these methods we're doing, remember, we're only doing a six second strip. So none of our measurements here is going to be accurate. It's all an estimate because the only accurate heart rate is if you have to count the entire 60 seconds, which we don't have time to do. All right. So all our heart rate counting here is are all estimates. So we've done two methods so far, the counting the PQRSTs in one 
in six seconds and multiply it by 10. Um, and then we also try the counting the big boxes between two R waves. And now let's try small, blo small boxes this time. Uh, let's use another R to R wave, uh, not R wave number five. Let's, let's find another R wave. <clears throat> R wave number one or an R wave number eight, which one in between? Let's try not to use number five. Let's try something else. And so we can compare. What about R wave number one? Can we use this? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's use the uh, small boxes method. So how many small boxes in one minute? 1,500. 1,500. So let's count the number of small boxes from this R to this R. So we know this is 5, 10, 15. And then 16, 17, 18, 19. It's not quite 19 because it didn't really reach the solid line. So let's say 18, 18 and 18.8. .8. Okay, let's try that. 1,500 divided by 18.8. .8. What do you got? Seventy-nine point seven. All right. Is it close enough to seven eight eight and eighty? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so there's no ten heart rate differences there. So that's acceptable. There you go. So all our methods are consistent. Therefore, our conclusion is this heart rate is about 80. Again, we only say an estimate because we only counted a six second strip. It's not a full minute. If you want a full minute, go right ahead, be my guest. But um, it's a waste of time and <clears throat> um, too much work. All right, so those are the methods. So on the test question, you'll have a question asking you to count the heart rate uh, on a strip. And uh, since we have some differences here, because I don't know what method you'll be using, what method you like, so therefore the answer choices will be a range. So it'll say uh, letter A, 70 to 80, letter B, 80 to 90, letter C, 90 to 100. Understood? Professor, question. Let's yes, say a patient has irregular heart rate, then okay. how do you suppose to do All right, so if, it's, if the rhythm is irregular, doesn't matter because from one, if you think about it, from one six second strip to the next six second strip, will they be the same? Will the heart rate be the same if the rhythm is irregular? Mm, yeah. Will they be the same? It's just the rhythm, I guess. It's not like... No, you're, you're counting the heart rate. Oh. So let me show you an example. Let me close some windows because my computer's slow. Sorry, my internet's really slow today.
Okay, look at this one, for instance. This is a fib. This is clearly irregular. So my question was, from one minute, so let's say this is one six-second strip. From this six-second strip to the next six-second strip, do you think they will be the same? No. No. So no. regardless, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is, regardless, if it's a reg, uh, irregular rhythm, no matter what method you use, all your answers will be all estimates. They will never be the same. So um, my answer to Yan's question is, you can use any method. However, just know that your answers will never be the same. Just like the patient's heart rate will never be also the same from one minute to the next minute. Does that make sense? Yes, and does that mean um, if we use the like oscillometer to measure their heart rate, that would be inaccurate and we instead need to manually count? Um, it's not in the sense that it's not accurate. The method you use to calculate it is accurate. However, our finding, our number will not be the same. Does that make sense? Meaning the method you use at that particular moment, when you, when you measured it, when you counted it, it is accurate. But remember, your answer for calculating it for at that moment will not be the same for the next moment. Does that make sense? Because the heart, patient's heart rate is very irregular. It will never be the same. It changes from one second to the next, from one minute to the next minute. So on the exam, we should just say undetermined. No, well, uh, so that means I will never give you a example oh, okay. that is also very hard for me to grade. <laughs> I mean, how do I grade that? Because um, there's no, do you understand? So most likely I will give you a uh, regular heart, um, a regular rhythm for you to count the heart rate. All right, so Yen wants a difficult question, but I had nothing like that in mind. So please read here. Again, the, I only want to know the P. What is the P? So these are examples of a P. And this is the, the, QR, the QRS. The numbers, by the way, you need to know. Uh, there's not a lot to measure. So for instance, a PR interval, this is our first measurement. So PR interval normally should only be 0 0.2 to 0 .0, uh, 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, that's the normal. Anything longer than that um, will be a heart block already. Anything shorter than that, uh, that means the heart rate is really fast and so on. This is the QRS interval. Go ahead. What page is that? So I can find it. Uh, 540. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, how about this? I only want the measurements for the PR interval and the QRS complex. Sound good? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm just giving you the minimum, okay? Minimum necessary. So we do need the PR interval. It's, it's, it's crucial when we're trying to interpret heart blocks because the problem in heart blocks is the PR interval. It's, it's long. So we need to know how long is it or is it because there are three degrees of heart blocks. We have uh, first, second, and third degree. And there are two types of second degree heart blocks, all um, differentiated by the PR interval. So again, the PR interval is the time it includes the P wave to right before the Q starts. So that right there is the PR interval. And of course, the P wave is only here, measures from when the, um, what's the P wave? Right here. So when the when the wave 
it left the isoelectric line to when it returned to the isoelectric line. So that right there is your P wave. And I want the PR interval. And I said the QRS complex, right? So the QRS complex is literally the Q, R, and the S. Um, we already did the rhythm. We used our paper as our caliper. Um, we determined if they're regular or not. We counted the heart rate. And then we'll see, are there P waves? Um, are there QRSs? What do they look like? Are there T waves? Okay, is the, is the T wave um, upright? T wave should be upright. If it's inverted, then that's a MI. Um, that's a STEMI. Um, the ST segment also must be um, isoelectric, meaning the ST segment should be flat. If it's depressed or elevated, then that means there's tissue ischemia. There's cardiac ischemia as well. So I kind of went ahead. So here's the steps for the calculating the heart rate. So we said we need a six second strip and we know how to count that. Nope, we know so that there are, there are 1500 yeah. small blocks in uh, one minute. And we also have 300. We have 300 small boxes in one minute. And the regularity, this is where you uh, used your paper to determine the regularity of the rhythm. Now, I think we're ready to do dysrhythmias now. Dysrhythmias are divided into, uh, you know what, let's take a break. Uh, come back at 10.55, okay, take a 15 minute break. And it will go faster. Um, I won't read the whole each dysrhythmia with you uh, because <clears throat> you can do that on your own. I'll just give you a guide on what to look for, what the test questions on the exam will be. Plus, again, if you want a full lecture on each dysrhythmia, they're already on iTunes U. Okay, so I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>